Hello, I'm Dr. Natalie Marks. This is Step by Step, where we take practitioners through important veterinary conditions and issues step by step. And today, we're walking through what to do when a cat presents with a poor appetite and poor quality of life. You're already thinking chronic kidney disease, right? Well, let's walk through the diagnostics and then the treatments. You can help these kitties and cats have a much better quality of life. Thank you to Alenco for sponsoring this edition of Step by Step. So let's begin in the exam room. It's an exam that I feel like we see almost every week. One of the most common presentations that we see for cats with chronic weight loss and poor quality of life. That might be something that we as veterinary team members actually note. Sometimes this isn't even something that the cat caregiver or cat parent actually feels is going on because there's a lot of misconceptions and myths out there about what cats actually do and act like and show to us when they're not feeling good. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to educate those families in the exam room of what we're seeing and why this is abnormal. We're gonna start with that family by asking history questions. We also can simultaneously start to do that physical exam. Physical exam findings that are consistent with the need for the chronic kidney disease workup would include polyuria and polydipsia, lethargy and weakness, inappetence. Remember, inappetence is broken into three different categories, which we often mislabel on our soaps. Anorexia is truly the complete loss of appetite, but we can also see hyporexia, which is a decrease in the pattern of eating, as well as dysrexia, which is a change in the pattern of eating. So these are the cats that are eating maybe the right amount every day, but they used to be those cats that jumped up on the nightstand at 4 a.m. and knocked everything over until their cat parents would feed them. And now these cats are sort of nibbling and grazing all day. That's an appetence and we need to know that. We're checking out hydration. We're looking at hair coat. We're also starting to do different judgments like body condition scoring, as well as muscle condition scoring. Every physical exam on a cat that presents with weight loss should include a fundic exam because we're looking to see if there's any presence of retinal hemorrhage or detachment. We may be able to feel that small irregular kidney and certainly there may be asymmetry to the kidneys. These cats may also have a history of vomiting. And then in very late stages of the disease, unfortunately, we can see some of those uremic ulcers and also very, very pale mucous membranes because many of these cats also do have chronic non-regenerative anemias. Now, wouldn't it be easy if all of those cats walked in with a sticker on their forehead and it's chronic kidney disease and we could just jump right in. But we know that for these patients, the right and very thorough exam leads to that differential list that also generates a list of foundational diagnostics that we want to do. Now, in this step-by-step, -step, of course, we're leading towards chronic kidney disease, but we know there are other differentials. So we want to make sure we have a thorough and complete foundational database. Foundational database starts, of course, with lab work. A CBC, that complete blood count, we wanna be looking to see especially what our red blood cell count is doing and if there's any signs of iron deficiency anemia along with this. We also would love to have a chemistry panel, a full and complete one with an SDMA. We also, in a perfect world, would love to have electrolytes. Potassium, especially important when we're talking about chronic kidney disease management. If you're only able to do a minimum database there, certainly one of our pre-anesthetic profiles where we're getting liver and kidney values would be an adequate start. But one thing that I cannot sort of back down on is that it's imperative that we have a concurrent or real-time urinalysis to pair with that lab work. We need to see if this cat can concentrate. We need to see what the sediment looks like, specifically looking for protein and bacteria or, or any types of casts. And in certain instances, that may also be needed to add on a low colony count urine culture for those where we suspect there may be an underlying pyelonephritis. 
A blood pressure is really, I think, a very cost-effective diagnostic tool. It can be done in the exam room or even home diagnostics if necessary. And then finally, imaging in the form of radiographs. Certainly there, we're ruling out any gross abnormalities. And then FGF23, looking to see more early detection of chronic kidney disease. Once we have that foundational lab work and you've analyzed that, chronic kidney disease diagnosis is based on some of those findings where we will certainly discuss a little bit more in detail as we go into the staging. But before we go into that, again, I reference that chronic kidney disease is not stamped on those patients. And so we'd love to make sure that we're ruling out some of the other top differentials that we might have on our list, including hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, as well as some of the gastrointestinal diseases like inflammatory bowel disease and neoplasia, and some liver diseases that may have some of the same clinical signs, at least on presentation. But let's assume that we have a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. We're very fortunate that we have experts in the field that have created the IRIS staging guidelines. Most of you, if not all of you, are probably very familiar with these guidelines. So let's go through these stage one and then stage two through four. For chronic kidney disease stage one, according to the IRIS guidelines, we need one of the following qualifiers to be there for this diagnosis. It's a persistently increasing creatinine with an SDMA in the normal range where no free renal cause is found, or we have a persistently increased SDMA, or we have abnormal kidney imaging, or the final qualifier can be persistent renal proteinuria. For chronic kidney disease stages two through four, we need both of these qualifiers to hit these stages. So we need an elevated creatinine and SDMA, and we need a urine-specific gravity of less than 1035. Now, what I don't want us to forget about is why that chronic kidney disease is there in the first place. Remember, there is a pretty long laundry list of possible primary or underlying causes that lead to chronic kidney disease in cats. Some of those might be found along the way in that foundational database. In other words, pyelonephritis. Acute kidney injury can lead to chronic kidney disease in cats. If we have a very high globulin finding on our lab work, we might suspect FIP and need to do additional and very specific viral testing. Glomerulonephritis, and certainly that persistent proteinuria might lead us to that finding. Amyloidosis can also happen in cats, and that's more of a breed risk. Polycystic kidney disease, very, very common in Persians, as we know. And then we always have to keep on our differential list the idea of neoplasia. For purpose of our discussion, though, for the rest of our step-by-step -step today, let's assume that our patient that presented with chronic weight loss and poor quality of life has a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease that has an underlying primary cause that we're able to fairly easily address. As we move forward with this treatment, I wanna make sure everyone is really aware of the two critical areas that make a difference in the quality of life of our chronic kidney disease cats. And that's the management of appetite and anemia. We're gonna start with appetite first. Our two goals are controlling weight loss and appetite. I'm sure many, if not all of you, are weighing cats at every visit. We also strongly consider nutritional support for these cats, but one of the most important things that we can do is early and aggressive appetite stimulation. And then finally, I'm going to pick Elura, FDA approved for the control of weight loss associated with chronic kidney disease in cats. Allura has a dual action approach, which is really critical for survival times and quality of life with our cats with chronic kidney disease. Remember, Allura is mimicking the natural occurring hunger hormone ghrelin. And that dual action, one, it binds the receptors in the hypothalamus to stimulate appetite, but it also stimulates growth hormone to be released from the pituitary gland. This causes the liver to release IGF-1 and create those metabolic changes the metabolic change and also the stimulation of appetite together produce weight gain. And that again, as we see from those research studies, is a critical piece of survival 
and also, even more importantly, quality of life. Now that second A I mentioned is anemia, and we want to make sure this is a priority, controlling and treating anemia. Using those same iris guidelines we've talked so much about already, we know that they say we want to slow the disease down by treating this in stage two and early stage three, and that once we have our chronic kidney disease cats in stage three late, as well as stage four, managing this can improve their quality of life. Now we can intervene with Varenzin CA1, which is a conditionally approved therapeutic. In these patients, what this is doing, it's actually increasing that patient's level of erythropoietin, which we know is the critically important hormone to stimulate the production of red blood cells. Those are the two main and critical core focus points for us. But there are a lot of additional therapies that we know can be very helpful for that very thorough approach to chronic kidney disease treatment. We want to manage hydration through subcutaneous fluid demonstrations and therapy. Protein and phosphate restriction is a critical component of this. Phosphate binders are also a part of chronic kidney disease management, as well as potassium supplementation for those patients that do need it based on our electrolytes. We want to manage that systemic hypertension. We want to treat the proteinuria that we see. And for some of those advanced and late stage patients, we may need to treat that protein losing nephropathy or supplement because of severe hypoalbuminemia. Before I end though, it's not just about the pharmaceuticals and nutritional management. There are also some other guidelines and recommendations that I would encourage us to give our cat caregivers and families to help improve that quality of life. So other recommendations include thermoregulation support, adding warming beds or orthopedic beds there, and some of them will benefit greatly from pain management that's appropriate and safe for cats with chronic kidney disease. We want to also do no harm, so avoid any of the nephrotoxic drugs and having fresh water available at all times, as we know most, if not all of these patients at some point will remain polydipsic. Thank you to Alenco for sponsoring this edition of Step by Step. For more information on feline chronic kidney disease, check out vetfolio.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go make a difference in these chronic kidney disease cats' lives together. Thank you.